All right, so for test two, big changes where we're going to change over to having the test next week, so on the 31st, assuming that's the Tuesday. Um, the formulas you want to know are the formulas that we've put into that two by two chart when we were on the blackboard previously. So the some number raised to a power or really just a bunch of numbers multiplied together. Um, our factorial symbol, our falling factorial symbol, our combination, so n choose k, and our multi choose our n multi choose k. And you'll want to make sure that you remember when each of these happens. So remember this first one here, when you had to just everything multiplied together, you didn't have to worry about making the numbers get smaller, repetition allowed, and order matters. Your following factorials and your regular factorials, repetition is now not allowed, but order still matters. Both the combination and the multi-choose here, order doesn't matter, but with the combination, you're not allowed to do repetition, and with the multi-choose, you are allowed to do repetition. Remember this guy behind the scenes as you were dealing with the multi-sets, the sets where you're allowed to have the repeated elements. Um, the other big thing that you want to make sure that you're okay with is you want to make sure you're okay with adding versus multiplying the different components of your number choices together. Remember, multiplication is when you just have different pieces and parts all of the same situation. And the only time you're going to add is if you have different cases specifically cases that can't occur at the same time. The formal buzzword there is mutually exclusive cases. Um, this next thing of able to fix overcounting or undercounting, this is the thing that we did in class where we either multiplied by an extra factorial or we divided by an extra factorial because we either needed to take whatever number we had and then all those objects needed to be rearranged some more or they were already in some order and we wanted to get rid of the order. So here's the part that's going to change. Able to show a formula is true, I went ahead and cut everything out of the test that has to do with proving anything, mainly so I could get your exam into a relatively manageable online format, mainly um, things like multiple, versus multiple choice uh, or matching or things like that. Okay, so anything that's even vaguely proof-related is gone in terms of what you will see on the test. Um, able to deal with a story problem, pretty much all of the counting problems are going to be in context of some story problem. So make sure you're very, the key thing there with a story problem is you want to pull out the key pieces of information. How many of your objects are you, de of your objects are you dealing with? How many of these objects are you selecting if you're selecting objects? How many of each type of objects are you getting to, are you able to select from, et cetera. Uh, inclusion, exclusion. We did inclusion, exclusion in class with respect to derangements. If you have a question that talks about derangements, I will give you the definition of what a derangement is. Remember that was when you had one of these permutations where you rearranged all of your numbers and you didn't have number two in position two. Sorry, but I would give you that definition if you use it. On your homework, you have several examples with inclusion, exclusion that are not with um, derangements and in fact just go back to sets. We've actually talked about inclusion, exclusion when we were back in sets at the beginning of the class. And then also pigeonhole principle. So the key thing here with pigeonhole principle in terms of how you can see these questions, you might see something like, can you guarantee that blank happens? And this might be something like a multiple choice question. You're like, yes, no, or maybe the yeses have some extra add-ons to them and say something like, yes, pigeonhole principle guarantees this, or some such like that. It also might be something where, if you remember, we had a question uh, or an example in class, and I believe it was on vending machines. And on that one, the, uh, the how the question was worded was just a little bit different where it basically gave you the same scenario as usual, but what it said was, hey, how many of these little snacks can you guarantee the person has bought? Okay. In that case, if you have a question that's worded in that format, which is probably a little bit more likely than the other format, you would be entering what is that number? In other words, how many of these things are you guaranteed that the person is able to grab? Okay, so that's it in terms of counting. You've got 
story problems that you're looking at pretty much for all of these guys, and then you would select what type of formula you want to choose when. And because of how I've demoed some of these questions, there are most likely going to be multiple parts for these story problems, where the leader parts would actually walk you through this thinking process. That way you can get partial credit on the questions. All right. So with relations, here's what you could see. First of all, you need to know what a relation is. The definition of the relation is where you've got your ordered pairs. So it's this guy. But you may also be asked to deal with a digraph. Because we're going to be an online test, I'm not going to ask you to draw a digraph. Instead, you might be given the digraph of the relation. Okay? But you want to make sure that you can handle dealing with the digraph of your relation. You also want to make sure that you can handle dealing with the matrix of your relation. You might either be given the matrix of the relation or you might be asked to create the matrix of your relation. And uh, that's actually possible in terms of Canvas. I can actually make it so that you see what looks like a, a um, matrix, and then you'd fill in missing blanks, either all or some. Okay. So key things that you want to make sure that you can do, make sure that you can actually figure out if your matrix not your matrix, if your relation has the six properties of reflexive, irreflexive, symmetric, asymmetric, anti-symmetric, and transitive. We are today going to talk about equivalence relations. Equivalence relations are relations that have a symmetric property, the symmet reflexive, symmetric, and transitive property. That's the definition of equivalence relation. So if you were asked something like this, you'd literally just go back and check, hey, does, does this relation have those three properties? Partial orders, we'll also talk about that today. And this is a relation that is reflexive, same as equivalence relation. Transitive, again, same as equivalence relation. But now it is anti-symmetric instead of symmetric. Okay. We actually are going to use partial orders at the end of the semester, but right now it's just to give you the definition. Okay. Um, today we're going to talk about this symbol here of this A mod R, which also deals with your equivalence classes. And again, we'll talk about what equivalence classes are today. Wow, I didn't spell that right at all. Sorry about that. Equivalence classes. Okay. In terms of if you have a uh, digraph, one of the things you might be asked about that is, hey, what's a path of length, I don't know, five? What's a cycle of length two? Can I find one in this uh, relation? To be fair, I haven't figured out how that you will appropriately enter that without just being a total free response essay type question. So those guys might turn into some sort of multiple choice section, or it might turn into some sort of drop down matching section, or it might just be some sort of essay question if you're asked about paths and cycles. So something that you may also be asked about is in degree or out degree. And this would just be if you have the digraph counting the number of arrows coming into your vertex, counting the number of arrows going out of your vertex, and you have both an in and an out degree for every single vertex in your digraph. Okay. Now, uh, the only thing we didn't talk about in terms of relations was that second bullet point of building new relations. It is ones that we're definitely not going to have is we're not going to have the composition. You'll definitely not see that. In terms of these last three right here, you can do it the exact same way you would with sets. So our complement is just everybody not in your relation. Union would be if you're given two relations, you just merge them together, and intersection is find the ones in common between two relations. It's possible that those guys are on there, but they are definitely sort of second tier questions. In other words, if this thing times out too long, um, they will definitely be the first questions that are done would be kicked out of the test. Okay. And the R inverse right here, this is where you just take all of your ordered pairs and you swap the first and the second coordinates. Or if you have the digraph, you take all of your arrows and reverse their direction. Okay. And then the last bullet point, which we said were proof techniques, that's just going to totally be cut off the exam. Okay. So questions from you guys. 
now that I try to make that so you can actually see it, the whole thing at once. Hopefully you guys feel a little better about what you can expect to see, ish, maybe, hopefully. All right, so I will plan on posting that um, marked up version of the study guide uh, to Canvas later today. And I'll keep the original one because that's a little bit scribbled a bit, so I'll make sure to, I'll have both versions, but definitely, it's not that anything would be wrong if you say the non-marked up version, but this gives you a little bit more focus. Um, with response to the question right there, no, I didn't mention whether we were gonna have the lockdown browser thing for the exam. And the answer is yes, the university does recommend this for now all online exams, if at all possible. So that's one of the things that we're actually gonna make sure is working on Thursday that you'll be able to get that done. What I am planning to do hopefully today, but definitely either today or tomorrow, is I am going to add something to your guys' Canvas site. So let me here go ahead and share with you um, your Canvas page. So you notice right here where we've got this block that says test. Normally this is where I put all of the information on test, and I'll share a link here as well. But if you go under the daily information spot right in here, what I'm gonna do is I will add in something probably specifically, uh, oh, it'll probably be between these two guys once they become visible for you, that's specifically for test two, and it's gonna go through all the things that you'll need to worry about, both for this lockdown browser stuff, um, but it's also going to, I'll probably put two little buttons there, possibly brightly colored like all of our other buttons have been, and one of them will get you directly to the practice test for Thursday. So you can go and just click on that button and it'll pop up the assignment immediately. And another one for test two, or at least that's the plan, okay? We'll see um, if I can get all that stuff put together in a logical and reasonable format. That way you have all the information you need for test two in one very concise spot. And I'll put a link to that in both of the information for the upcoming days, which you can't see yet because, well, there's nothing there. But once that actually gets created, I'll put a link in here to the thing that only deals with test two, just like when we go back to our main page right here, inside of the test button, if it will come up, I'll go ahead and under test two, put a link that says to more information or something along that line, okay? And the marked up version of the study guide will go right here. Other questions? All right, so since I am not seeing anything else from you guys, let us jump into the next thing. So, the plan for today is to do a few more examples, specifically dealing with our relations and to give ourselves a little bit of a running start. Um, I had this example, which was already prepped up on Poll Everywhere. And I saw that there's a bazillion and one answers from you guys. So if you've already um, looked at this example, awesome. We're gonna go through it and you guys can tell me what you think the answers are. If you haven't gone through it, feel free to go and log into our normal Poll Everywhere spot, uh, which is pollev.com. Actually, let me just write it right up here, just a second. So you can actually go find it at com backslash experts. Or if you're doing it in the app, whatever you already did in your app. Okay. So if we've got this guy right here, what do you guys think? Is it reflexive? Well, let's check. I see multiple votes for no right now. Well, we've got one, one. We've got two, two. We've got three, three. It looks like we've got all of our doubled up ordered pairs. So what's missing? Hmm? 
So there's the key thing, always watch what your given set is. If you're not given a set, you can assume that that given building set is just the numbers that are used in the relation. But if you are given that building set, um, definitely make sure all of those doubled up ordered pairs are in there. So this guy here, it's not reflexive because 4-4 four, four is totally missing from your relation. Now, what about irreflexive? Do you guys think it's irreflexive? Also a no. And in this case, though, what's the issue with it not being irreflexive? Because this time it has what? Well, there's multiple things it could have. But as long as you have one of your doubled up ordered pairs, it doesn't matter which one, any of those three that are underlined, most of you have told me one, one, um, that would be the issue of it not being ill-reflexive, because ill-reflexive has to have none of those doubled up ordered pairs. Now, what do you think? Is this guy symmetric? Now, not going to lie, symmetry is often easiest to see from the digraph. So if we go ahead and grab our digraph, so one, two, three, four, we've got one, 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 two, one, three, two, one, two, 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 three, three, one. And notice as I'm reading them out, I'm drawing the arrows in the same direction. Three, two and three, three. And notice here, it's really easy to see that this digraph now is not reflexive or re irreflexive because you've got some but not all of your loops, which is really, really common. Okay. Now, symmetry. Symmetry says if you take any two of your vertices or any two of your elements, if you prefer, if you take any two of your vertices in your digraph and they're not the same vertex, so we don't care about the loop at one to one, but if we take, say, like one, two, if you have Here's the key thing. If you have an edge between two vertices, you have to have both edges or both directions. So what do you think? In that picture, if we have an edge between two vertices, two different vertices, do we actually have both directions of our arrows or our arrows? Or both directed edges is the very proper way of saying it. We do. So in this particular case, that means it's totally going to be symmetric right here. Now notice this is kind of a trick question. If you look at four and three, are there any edges between four and three? Nope, but that's okay. The only issue we're excluding with symmetry is we're excluding the case where you have exactly one directed edge between any two vertices. So that's the thing. With symmetry, it's either all or nothing. Okay? So you got both directed edges or you have no directed edges. That's the key thing with symmetry. Okay? Everybody okay so far? We're about to jump to the next guys. All right, seeing no questions from you guys, the next one here is if we look at the asymmetric property, anti-symmetric property, and transitive property, and let me go ahead and draw in the digraph again here real quick. I'm now regretting not having the picture on this second slide. So while I'm drawing in this picture, what do you guys think? Are we asymmetric or anti-symmetric for this particular relation? Either, neither, both? So we've got a couple group, a couple of boats for neither. So remember with asymmetry, what happens? You can't have any loops. Do we have any loops? Yes. So that means we're not going to be asymmetric. Now, the more important part of asymmetry that's also included in anti-symmetry is you're not allowed to have any arrows any connections between two different vertices have the arrows going both directions. In other words, you can't have this situation where you've got your directed edges going in both directions. And as soon as you have one pair of vertices that has that sort of a connection, you are not going to be either asymmetric or anti-symmetric. 
So I'm going to go ahead and write down that pair we, felt we talked about. And then the last one is the transitive property, and it turns out that this one does, in fact, have the transitive property, and you can do it a couple of different ways. You can make a chart where you actually find all of your length two paths. In other words, you go and you find your R2 relation, so all of your length two paths, and what you'll find is once you grab all of those length two paths, they are, in fact, every single one of them inside of that original relation. And that tells you that you are going to be transitive here. So this guy turned out to be both transitive and symmetric, but nothing else. Questions make sense? Kind of okay. I know I glossed over the transitive property, mainly because I wanted to grab an, an extra example at the end for today. All right, seeing nothing from you guys, let us look at another example. So suppose you have this guy, and if you have that guy right there, and I'll go ahead, I can actually initialize this, so if you want, you can see it on poll everywhere as well. Um, if you have this guy, what do you guys think? Is it going to be, have any of these properties? Do you think it's going to be reflexive, irreflexive, symmetric? Oh, I am. So on something I'm not sharing with you guys, I actually was very sneaky today and uh, am watching what your guys' responses are, and it's very interesting. So what do you guys think? Is it reflexive, irreflexive? not going to be either of them, so it won't be reflexive because you're missing one of your loops. Specifically, maybe you pick on 2-2. Two, two. There's no loop at 2-2. Two, two. Huh? Now, irreflexive, though, it's also not irreflexive because you actually have at least one loop. So this is the same issue that we had in the last example where you have some but not all of your loops would actually make it so you can't be either reflexive or irreflexive. Now, symmetry, what do you guys think? Is this graph going to be symmetric? Remember what symmetric meant. It meant between any two vertices you ha that have an edge between them, you have to have both directed edges, in other words, directed edges going in both directions. Nope, so here you can definitely find at least one situation. I'm going to pick on one and two right there. Or if you look at one and two, you do not have both directed edges between there. So here, if you wanted to explain to somebody why it's not symmetric, you would say, hey, we do have the edge one, two, but we do not have the directed edge two, one. Huh? So that would be the idea there. Now, let's do the last three properties. So for the last three properties, we've got asymmetry and anti-symmetry. So for asymmetry, the key thing here was any two vertices that are not the same, that have an edge between them, have exactly one directed edge. And there are no loops. So what do you think? Could we be asymmetric here? And we can't be asymmetric here because we've got the loops, just like we had issues with irreflexive up top. And we can actually say the same reason. We had the loops. But if you ignore the loops, you met the other criteria. We've got any time that there's a, one of these arrows, one of these directed edges between any two different vertices, there's no more than one of them. So that does mean we are anti-symmetric. And that's no worries right there. Now, the last uh, property to check is the transitive property. And the transitive property is super fun to check with this particular graph or digraph. Okay. Everybody okay with the first five properties? As long as you have the definition of the first five, five properties, they're normally okay for most people. 
You just got to make sure you remember the definition. All right, so let us move on to transitive. So the transitive property or transitivity says what we need is for any two loops, I should have said two loops, any length two path, so anybody of this orientation, if you have that guy, then you are guaranteed to have this one down here. Now note, it's an if-then statement. So if you don't have a length two path, you don't have to worry about the then part of this statement. You don't have to worry about that much darker arrow existing or not existing. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. One of the ways is you can go ahead and you can throw this thing into a matrix. I am not going to do that today just because it's a little tedious and I didn't set up a way to like share a calculator, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So here's the way you can do it without a calculator. I'm gonna go ahead and mark out, and we're not gonna do all of these, I'm just gonna show you the chart way that's not with the calculator. Okay. So here's my choices for A, B, and C. Suppose you start with A. Now, A equaling one. One can go in several locations, it can stay at one. It can go to two, it can go to three, or it can go to five. Okay. Now, then you go over and look to see where you can build a length two path. Notice this is the same sort of scratch work that we did for um, when we were trying to find R2. Literally the same thing. Okay. So here when we're at B, where can we go? Where we can still go to one, two, three, four, five. I actually almost wrote four there. But if we were at two, where's the only place we can go when we're at two? You can go to three. Now, if you get to three, where can you go from three? Nowhere, so that means this is a dead end, and it's not gonna be in our calculations. We can actually just go ahead and cross that guy off. Now, what about if we get to five? Can we go anywhere from five? We can go up to three. So what this means is we need to check, do we have not a path of length two starting at one and getting to wherever we were supposed to end, but can we go there in one step? If you ever use a loop, so this first row right up there, it'll always work. So most people exclude using loops anyway because it'll always work. Now if we go to the second line, we started at one, we ended at three. Could we start at one and end at three doing it in one step? or just following one directed edge. So can we jump one directly to three? Okay. So here, one to three, we just follow this guy right here. So yep, that one will work. And notice one to three, that's the same one to three, even though we went through five this time, so that one still works too. Yes, so starting at one is gonna always work here. Notice this graph is very, very symmetric. So I'm gonna skip out on doing the stuff that starts at vertex four. If you started at vertex four, it would be an exact mirror image of the work we just did. So vertex four would also work just fine. Okay. So I'm gonna go then to vertex two. So if we start at vertex two, where can we go next? You can only go to three, and if you're at three, where can you go next? Ah, yes, uh, good catch there. The symmetry there was not the same as the symmetric property. I should have said mirror image would be better. So here, once you get to three, you cannot um, go anywhere. So this guy is actually gonna be cut out of the running because there is no length two path that starts at vertex two. Please notice mirror imaging here, vertex two and vertex five are gonna act the exact same way. They're gonna interact with different vertices, but it's the same structure behind the scenes of the graph. So I'm gonna skip out on actually starting anywhere at five, but what you'll find is there's no length two paths that start at five either. 
So if we then move on to the next vertex, which would be starting at vertex 3, can we find a path that starts at vertex 3 and is a length 2 path? In this case, you can't even get to a length 1 path, so we'll cross this one out of the running as well. So notice this particular example I chose on purpose. It does turn out to be transitive, but notice part of that is because there are so few length two paths. So many places, specifically if you start at vertex two, three, or five, have no length two paths whatsoever. Okay. Questions, make sense, kind of okay-ish. And if you want to be super duper lazy, okay, this is not as lazy as humanly possible, but it is somewhat lazy, you can also throw this into a matrix, throw the matrix into your calculator, square it, and if all the non-zero numbers correspond to entries in your relation, that would also mean that it's transitive. And I don't care if you do that, that's perfectly fine too, as long as you're comfortable using your calculator in that way. So. We are going to have more examples of these relations, but I'm going to transition now into talking about equivalence relations. Okay? So they're going to be relations that specifically are have the reflexive property, the symmetric property, and the transitive property. And that's it in terms of the definition of our equivalence relation. So this is the guy we're going to focus on for the rest of today. Okay? Now the other definition is somebody called the partial order. And it is a relation that has the reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive properties. And this one here is somebody we're not going to focus on at this point in class. We're going to come back to him at the probably what will end up being the last topic in the semester. Okay. But just as a heads up, a very, very tiny example of an equivalence relation would be somebody like this. It actually looks almost identical to somebody we had before. So the symmetric or the symmetry would tell you here that all of your connections, all of your arrows are doubled up. So if you have a directed edge between any two different vertices, you have to have both directions. That guarantees symmetry of what we've drawn in so far. You also have to have the reflexive property. So if you had a fourth guy like we did in a previous example, you'd want to make sure that that loop is over there on the fourth guy too. So this guy would actually be an example of somebody who is an equivalence relation. And while I didn't talk about transitive property, transitive property will actually work there just fine. And the reason I pulled this example is because it looked almost identical to our very, very first example. The only difference is we actually had a loop on that fourth vertex where we did not on the previous example. Difference between equivalence relation and partial order. The difference really would be here, the anti-symmetry part, all of the places where you've got the both directions for your directed edges, you just have one edge. And it would need to go in the direction that makes sure you still have the transitive property. Okay. But that's it in terms of the definitions. Okay. So now we're going to jump into an example. Everybody got the definitions written down as you want. Seeing nobody yell at me, I will switch to the next slide. All right, so suppose we have this example. So for this guy right here, what do you guys think? Is it an equivalence relation? So, it, or is it a partial order? So in order to check both of those guys, the equivalence relation, you would need reflexive property, symmetric property, and then the transitive property. And for the partial order, you would switch out symmetry with anti-symmetry. So let's check it out. What do you guys think? Is this an example of somebody who has the reflexive property? So in terms of reflexive, we've got all of our doubled up ordered pairs. In terms of symmetry, and it's probably easiest to see it in this orientation. So we've got all the doubled up ordered pairs. Now we also have one, one, and one, not one, 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 two, and one, three. We also have two, one, and two, two, got it. Two, three, three, one, and three, two. So notice it is sym symmetric because it's got, 
if it's got a um, directed edge between any two different vertices, it's got them both. Now, last property is a transitive property here, and I'm gonna go ahead and say in this particular situation, notice our R is actually the full cross product of A cross A, correct? And what that means is automatically it's gonna be transitive because if you go and look for all the possible length two paths, you're not gonna start and stop at some um, vertex that's not one, two, or three. So as soon as you get everybody in A cross A, you are automatically transitive. I like having automatically transitive. Now, what do you guys think? Is this guy asymmetric? It is not, why? Well, asymmetric says loops don't matter, so there's no worries there, but you can't have the doubled up directions. So for example, we have both one, three, and three, one. That's something that you cannot have for anti-symmetry. Um, there is a situation where you can be both symmetric and anti-symmetric, uh, but this is not that case. So just as a side note, not that I have a side right now. So second or sort of related example, suppose you have your building set is one, two, and suppose your relation, your R, is given by the digraph, a with a loop and B with a loop. What do you guys think? Is this thing reflexive or irreflexive? I know it's not talking about symmetry yet, but I'm getting there. It is reflexive in this case because we've got loops on all the vertices. And because my box here is so teeny tiny, I'm gonna go ahead and write reflexive with a check mark, but I'm not gonna write irreflexive. So this one here would be a situation where it would also be symmetric because everywhere that you have a connection between two different vertices, if there's one connection, there's both connections. In other words, you have all or none. In this case, you have none. For anti-symmetric, same sort of reasoning applies. At most, you have one directed edge between any two different vertices. Here, you never have the one, you always have the no edges. So it's the nothing case. And it actually turns out if you only have um, loops, you are automatically transitive as well. So this is one of the very, very few situations where you are both an equivalence relation and a partial order. It is actually relatively rare to be both symmetric and uh, anti-symmetric, um, so this is when you have no edges other than loops, that's when you get symmetry as well as either the anti-symmetry if there's any loops or asymmetry if you actually have no uh, ordered pairs in your relation at all if your relation is actually the empty set. Uh, for an equivalence relation, yes, you can have more than the properties of just the reflexive, symmetric, or transitive property. The definition of equivalence relation guarantees reflexive, symmetric, and transitive properties, and it doesn't care about any of the other ones, but it's totally cool to have the extra properties as well. Like this one here, um, that tiny boxed example would be considered an equivalence relation, and it has that extra property of the anti-symmetric property. Okay. So that would be the idea behind um, determining equivalence relations. So let us now talk about equivalence classes. So an equivalence class, and here's the specifics. You start off and you have to have an equivalence relation. Your equivalence class of some element in your building set is defined by these square brackets right there. And specifically, it's the set of all of your elements that are related to A. So A is gonna be the first guy in your ordered pair, and you list out all of the elements in the second position of your ordered pair. It's essentially like 
the formal math terms are what's A being mapped to? Or if you prefer, it's like finding the range of A if we were talking about functions. Now, the other fancy notation is this guy called Q mod R. The slash is actually read mod R, it's not a fraction. And it's called the quotient set of R. So what this is, is this is a set of all the equivalence classes of A. So literally you could actually just make a set and dump in every single one of these equivalence classes from A. Remember with sets, duplicates get crossed off. So while technically if your set A included the numbers say one through four, you could say, hey, square bracket one, comma, square bracket two, square bracket three, square bracket four, you would be technically correct, but some of the uh, congruence classes typically overlap. So normally what people do is they actually talk about the cardinality of the quotient set, which is the number of different equivalence classes. Uh, roughly speaking, yes. Mod, roughly speaking, is the same thing as that percent sign when you're uh, programming, yeah. Uh, in this context, it would be a little bit different because the actual function in coding is specific to integers. And in math, we use it not just on integers, but also on sets. And in this connotation, it's in terms of sets, but it's the same rough idea. You're pulling something big down to something more manageable. All right, so let us look at an example. And so this example starts off with some, some relatively small set and relation on the set. So this guy here says, hey, we've got the building set one, two, three. We've got the relation R, which is the ordered pairs, one, 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 two, two, one, two, two, and two, three. So let me go ahead and draw this out as a picture. We've got one, two, and three. We've got one, one, we've got one, two, two, one, two, two, and two, and three, three. Now, quick check. Do you guys think this, this is an equivalence relation? First of all, does it look like it's reflexive? Okay, so reflexive, and I'm gonna abbreviate. It's reflexive because it's got all of its loops. Now, what do you guys think? In terms of symmetry, does it look like if you have an edge between any two different vertices, you've got both of them? Hmm? Now, the only different vertices that have edges between them are one and two, so you've just got that one case. And the last thing deals with the transitivity property, and I'm gonna go ahead and just tell you this guy is transitive. And the only length two paths that don't include loops that you've got is between one and two, and we've got that just fine. All right, so if we wanted to deal with equivalence classes, let's actually knock them out, and I think they're gonna fly in. Awesome. So what you would do is you would actually look at them for each of your elements in A. So if we grab the element one, you then go to your relation, and if one is the first element in the ordered pair, who are the second elements in the ordered pair where one is the first element in the ordered pair? In other words, I'll write it out. These are all of the elements B, and those B, where you have one comma B and we'll actually list them out. What do you guys think? I'll be helpful. I'll underline guys that start with one. So ordered pairs that start with one are the first two. This is actually one of the reasons I like writing out uh, the relations in some sort of systematic way with your ordered pairs. So yes, your second element, of those ordered pairs are simply gonna be one and two. Notice, we do not have the ordered pairs in this equivalence class. We only have these second elements from our ordered pairs that start with one. That's the key thing to know is these equivalence classes, they're totally just gonna to be subsets of your original building set A. If you wanna put that in, that would be all of these guys are gonna be various subsets of A. Now, if we then look at the equivalence class of two, 
this would be looking at all ordered pairs where the first position is a two, what's the second position? So what do you guys think? What should I write inside of those curly braces for the equivalence class of two? It's the same one, two. So we've got here, if we look at all of our ordered pairs that start with a two, we again have a one and a two. Go ahead and write that in. Then down here, if we do our last equivalence class, we'll have our equivalence class of three. This is find all of the elements where you have an ordered pair that starts with three and then ends with blank. And in this case, yep, there's only one of them. And so you would just put a three in here. Note, one of the things that happens automatically with equivalence classes, and this is a result of any way that you use mods, is it takes your set A and it cuts it up into pieces. The official term is partitions. Partition in math simply means you have your, whatever it is, typically a set, and you literally go and chop your set up into a bunch of subsets. There are no overlaps between any of your subsets. Notice. These guys are all subsets of A, and the, technically these two guys are going to be the same set. So if we look specifically just at one, two, and then three, notice they are disjoint, so there's no overlap between them. Their intersection is the empty set, and if you union them together, you would get the full set A. Yeah, there you go. I didn't even think of that one. That's a good example, like partitioning a hard drive. You're literally putting a wall in the set, in this case, instead of the hard drive. So if you were then asked what's the cardinality of AR, what would you do? Well, you don't have to write out this, but I'm going to. I'm going to go ahead and grab and say that our set a mod R, which is just all of your equivalence classes, while you could write it as simply the equivalence classes of one, two, and three, equivalence class of one and the equivalence class of two are really the same thing, so you don't need them both. Which means if you are asked what are the distinct number of equivalence classes, you would just have two because those are your two distinct sets. So if you look over here, you only grab the distinct ones. Okay. Kind of makes sense, a little bit makes sense. Questions? Now, anybody want to know a trick on how to find these from the actual digraph, if you have a digraph? Okay. So if you have a digraph, in other words, it's a small enough relation where this is feasible, Notice anything about that particular picture, specifically as relates to counting up two things. Uh huh. So the equivalence classes, when you have an equivalence relation, relates to the number of pieces of your digraph. So notice here your digraph has two distinct pieces, piece number one, which corresponds to your equivalence class of either one or of two, depending how you want to deal with it, and piece number two that corresponds to the equivalence class of three. These are, um, in graphs, no, in terminology, these are called components of the graph. In other words, it's like looking at two graphs that are just sitting next to each other. So however many of these little components you have, that's the same number of equivalence classes you have, and if you read off these guys right here, those connections are going to be what's going to form your equivalence classes. Now you have to reinterpret them in terms of how equivalence classes are defined, but these are all of the ordered pairs. These directed edges correspond to all the ordered pairs that will form your equivalence classes. Same deal right down there. Okay. Now, Equivalence classes are used a lot, especially in equivalence relations. They're so big that this trick is not feasible anymore. And in that case, you you got to look at other things. Okay. Questions make sense? Kind of feeling okay. I do have another example, but my next example I'm going to throw to you guys. So ask questions now before I throw it over to you guys.
All right, I am not seeing any questions from you guys. So here is the next example. So, done a couple of things for you. First of all, I have not even attempted to put you guys into your normal in-class groups. I have set it up, however, as you added today to have the computer put you into randomized groups. So we'll see how that goes. Okay? But this is the activity. Um, in terms of the question, you look at the set A, that's all of the integers from 31 to 62. So there's several of them. Um, we're going to define the relation R to be as follows. A is related to B exactly when or if and only if integers A and B have the same units digit. I went ahead and gave you an example here. So that would mean A here would be the 31. B here would be the 61. And remember the units digit is that guy right there. Now, here are the three questions. The first question is, do you think this guy is an equivalence relation? Hint, do not actually write out all the ordered pairs. There's too many of them. Just think in terms of this definition of integers having the same units digit. Part B and C are only going to work if it's an equivalence relation. Hint, it should be, unless I screwed up. Okay. So part B here says find all the equivalence classes of A. See if you could actually figure out what you think this A mod R might be. And then the final question here, and this is really sort of the culmination, the main point we want to get to is, what do you guys think the cardinality of A mod R might be? Okay. So notice this is exactly what we just did. The only difference now is your set that you're dealing with is a bit bigger. And your relation, if you actually wrote out all of the ordered pairs, would probably be too unmanageable to deal with. Although if you want to write out some of them and then extrapolate what everybody else would look like, that would be fine. So you're going to have to do this, um, think of it more conceptually as opposed to being able to write out all your ordered pairs. Okay. Questions before I break you guys out and send you guys out into little groups? All right, I am not seeing any questions from you, so just giving you a heads up on how these groups work. Um, just a second, I'm gonna restart it because somehow it threw everybody into the same group, which is just not helpful at all, okay? Um, so this exact group activity is also on Canvas, so if you already grabbed it, awesome. If you didn't grab it, you can also find it right there because I'm about to have to stop sharing my screen here with you guys. Okay, so this is the, um, so here's our activity. Sorry about that, I started talking before I had shared the screen with you. So here's the activity you had. You had your set, the integers were 31 through 62. I'm going to skip out right now and talking about equivalence relation. I'm just going to tell you it is an equivalence relation. Um, but if you wanted to start looking at your A mod R, in other words, you wanted to look at the equivalence classes, you could do it systematically. You could start just knocking out all the numbers in this set. Don't really write them all out. Okay. So at 31, who are the guys in the set? Well, anybody who is has the same digit as 31. So in that set, you've got 31. You've got 41, you've got 51, you've got 61. So those are all the guys with the same di units digit. Now with 32, you've got 32, you've got 42, you've got 52, you've got 62, and that's everybody. So anybody have a guess for 33? So hopefully you're thinking 33, 43, 53, and no 63 because 63 is not in your set. Yep. And so then you keep going. So then we've got 34, we've got 44, we've got 54. Ah. Then we've got 35. You guys are probably thinking this faster than I can write it out. 35, 45, 55. Then we have 36. Notice one of the key things, and this is something that everybody forgets at least once, is you always include the actual element that's inside the brackets as one of the elements in your set. Then we've got 37, 47, 57, 38, 48, 58. Notice all of these are going to look the same. 
So then we have, what is this, 39, 49, 59, and then we have 40, we have 50, and we have 60, and I accidentally wrote 60 in front of 50. Okay. Now, as soon as you try to do 41, I don't have to write 41 because 41 is the same as, for those of you who are still here, 41 is the same as what equivalence class? 31. Notice. 31, 41 have the same equivalence class, but 51 and 61 will also have the same equivalence class. So at this point, have we actually used up all of the numbers 31 through 62 in each of those sets? What do you guys think? Have we grabbed all of the numbers 31 through 61? If the answer is yes, that means you found all of your equivalence classes. So this guy here, that is your A mod R. Now. The last question here asked you what was the cardinality of A mod R, so any guesses what that cardinality is going to end up being? Hmm? And notice you could actually answer the cardinality here without writing out A mod R. Why? By thinking how many different units digits there are. How many different units digits there are there? Well, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 9. So that means there's a grand total of 10 digits or 10 possibilities for your unit digits, and there's where that 10 came from. So that's actually one of the reasons where people will start looking at um, this A mod R is super useful, but often, especially at this level of a class, the thing that we'll ask is, hey, what's the cardinality of this guy? That way, if you have a really big set like what we had with this example, you can logic your way through the answer as opposed to writing everything out. Yeah, so if we actually used all of the integers 0 through 100, if it was still defined the same way of units digit matching, we would have the equivalence class of 0 would equal the equivalence class of 100, and all the ones in the middle that are the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 as well. Yeah. And that's where the mod part comes in, because mods act the same way. But that was it. That's what I wanted to get to. Sorry for running over, guys, but I'll go ahead. Uh, yeah, the answer to part A would, roughly speaking, be a yes. I'll go ahead and post the work for that, but you have to, like, dis you would describe it out. So just as a heads up, if you had a question like this on the exam, part A here would not be something I would give you. I would start off saying, hey, this is an equivalence class, and then you might get the part B and C that says, how many of these things do you have? And it might be a smaller set, some smaller uh, situation there. But I'll go ahead and add in some of the extra details for Part A, and I'll, I'll post this annotated version up online for you guys.